Good morning. <clears throat> so good to see everyone this morning. If you would take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Our sympathy goes to the family of Burley Phillips. He was a member of Union Central. A lot, most folks in here know him. And, uh, of course, his wife just passed away about nine days before he did. So, <coughs> wonderful Christian couple there. So, let's remember the Burley Phillips family in our prayers. Francis Dacus is back home. Blood pressure being treated with medicine. She's doing pretty good, Kathy? Well, she's still weak. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we're on the right track. All right. So let's remember Francis in our prayers. Also, uh, the family of Larry Brackenridge, who passed away. Uh, this is Mary Brackenridge and Liddy Moore's brother in law. So let's remember. Mary and Liddy, and uh, I believe he was a member at Bethel, wasn't he? Yeah, he was a member at Bethel Church of Christ. Um, let's remember Don Ork, and I just found out last night that he did have to go back to the hospital and get more fluid took off of him. So, um, Shelley said he's doing better again now, but He's had a had a tough time again. So, and remember, if you know somebody who can sit with him, to let the elders know. And let's continue to remember Glenda Clements, and she is not home, but she's doing better, right? And you, for those who don't know Glenda, she's the one that uh, she came forward here about two weeks ago on a Sunday night, I believe, and rededicated her life to the Lord. So let's remember Glenda. Uh, which hospital is she in? St. Okay. So she's in St. Bernard's. Have any idea how much longer she'll be in there? No. Okay. All right. I am. Yes. We need to remember Brandy Okay. I see you, really. Mm -hmm. For uh, low, uh, low potassium. Brandy Trawick. This is Lisa Glover's granddaughter. And I see you. And Paragold? Uh -huh. Okay. Anyone else? Who's that, Peggy? This is Henry's mother-in-law, uh, Tammy's mother, Peggy Carr. And uh, Peggy's been attending here for quite some time now. Let's remember Peggy. Uh, say again what she had going on. She's got the flu. She's got the flu, okay. So let's remember her. Anyone else? Uh, Wade just told me he's going to have cardiac surgery on Wednesday. Same Who's this? Wade Taylor. Wade Taylor having what kind of surgery? Carteroid. Carteroid. Carteroid artery. Is that how you say that? Carteroid. Carotid. Carotid. Yeah. When he, when he first said it up here, I thought he was saying cataract. So it's Thomas's fault. <laughs> well, I hope everything goes well with that, Wade. Anyone else? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we humbly pray before you. We give you praise and glory for everything you blessed us with, and we're we're so thankful for everything you blessed us with. And 
We're so thankful, Father, for you being mindful of us. As, the, as Psalm 8 says, if we, we look around, we see everything that you've created. We're just humbled that you, that you think of us, that you're mindful of us. And uh, we're so thankful for that. We don't really know how to comprehend it, but we're, we appreciate it so much. We love you so much and so thankful for everything that you do for us. Pray, Father, you'll be with all those just mentioned on our prayer list. Pray that you'll be with Brandy Trawick as she's in ICU. And just pray, Father, you'll be with Brandy and, and pray, Father, that you'll be with the doctors as they take care of her. Pray that she looks to you for strength and guidance. Pray that you'll be with Peggy Carr. Pray that she gets to feeling better as soon as possible. <clears throat> Pray that you'll be with Wade Taylor. Pray that everything goes well with his surgery this week. <clears throat> and uh, pray that he makes a full recovery as soon as possible. Thankful that Frances Dacus is back home. Pray that she gains her strength soon. Pray that everything gets treated right with her medicine. <clears throat> Pray that you'll be with Don Orr, who's had to go in the hospital twice just recently and just <clears throat> pray Father that you'll bless him and give him his strength. Pray that you'll be with the Burley Phillips family and the Larry Brackenridge family and comfort them as only you can. Pray that you'll be with us this morning as we study your word. Pray that we apply it to our lives in a manner well pleasing in your sight. Pray that we worship you in spirit and in truth. We love you and we thank you for Jesus. And we pray Father also you'll be with our five seniors. And pray, Father, that as they graduate from high school, we pray, Father, that they'll never graduate from, from being in your church. And pray, Father, that they will remain faithful to you. And pray that you'll bless them in a special way. And pray that you'll be with us all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. First <clears throat> uh, Peter chapter 5. And right here, Peter, the Apostle Peter, also lets us know that he was an elder. He was an elder in the Lord's church. And we talked about last week that the Apostle Paul was not an elder. Uh, one of the qualifications for being an elder was to be married. And Paul never was married. And, but, but Peter was. We know that uh, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. And so Peter was indeed married. And it's, it's interesting to think that uh, the Catholic Church claimed that Peter was the first pope. And yet they don't let the Pope get married. So they're very inconsistent in that. Of course, we know that Peter was not the first Pope. There's no such thing as a Pope in the Lord's Church. But that's the claim that they make, that he was the first Pope. And yet, <clears throat> he was married. And they won't let the Pope get married. So, very inconsistent. Uh, it's a false claim, but not only that, their claims are inconsistent. So uh, I hope we, we understand that. There's one head of the church. Peter never claims to be the head of the church. <coughs> never. And <clears throat> Jesus is the head of the church. We are the body. He is the head. And I know we all understand that. But I just thought I would mention that while we're talking about this. So let's look at... What he said, we, we actually read this last week, but we didn't get to talk about it much. The elders who are among you I exhort. I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, 
nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief ship when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. I want you to notice here he he's referring to Jesus, of course, and he calls Jesus the chief shepherd. Notice that Peter doesn't say that he is the chief shepherd. He says Jesus is the chief shepherd. In, in the original language, of which I'm not an expert, there's three different words used to designate leaders of the church. And, uh, and shepherd is one of them. The word translated into shepherd. And one is translated into bishop. One is translated into elders. And uh, he uses them he uses all three of them here, doesn't he? That's a good point. The, the elders, uh, is that one Episcopos? Or is that one, am I, is that a, that's overseer. Presbyteros. Presbyteros is elder, and that's in verse 1. Verse 2 is overseer, that's Episcopos. And then, uh, then verse 4, the shepherd, well also in verse 2, shepherd is... Point main. So all, all three of those Greek words describe the same office. Now, those three Greek words get translated into about five English words. Uh, it's translated as pastor in Ephesians chapter 4. I'm not sure why, uh, but it does get translated as pastor. Uh, and that's the word shepherd, isn't it? Yeah. And that's uh. And the word, the word poimain is translated other places to designate, you know, like a shepherd out with the flock and all that. Yeah. Which it's a, a, a word used quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, one of the other words, one of the other English words would be bishop. So you got three Greek words that get translated into five English words, and all five English words describe the same office. And it's elder, bishop, overseer, shepherd, pastor. That's our five English words that describe the same office. Uh, all five of them's biblical. And, uh, you know, I think probably the, the unbiblical way that other groups use a couple of those words is probably why we don't use them. Because, and I'm serious, you know, because the denominational word world misuses the term pastor. So there's nothing wrong with that word. Nothing wrong with that word at all, but it doesn't describe me. It describes our elders. So I hope you understand that. It doesn't describe me. I'm not your pastor. We've got four pastors. And uh, the other word would be bishop. We don't use that word much in the Lord's church either because of the way the, the Catholic church misuses that word. So to, to avoid the confusion, we hardly ever use those words pastors and bishops. But as long as they are used biblically, it would be okay to use those. But you got that misunderstanding there. We're afraid that uh, people will misunderstand it. Did I see a hand go up? You made the point right there at the end. Okay. So um, be, be so thankful for our elders, our overseers, our shepherds. They are shepherding the flock. I think it would be, uh, I think it'd be appropriate to notice some scriptures about this office. Uh, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. There it talks about the qualifications. And I know we just covered this. Art and I, I, I covered deacons and Art covered elders um, just a few months back. But it's okay to, to look over these again. And we're not going to dwell on the qualifications, but our, I am going to mention them because we're going to notice a few scriptures here. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And here he, they're referred to as bishop. 
which literally means overseer, uh, and that's what uh, my footnote says. This is a faithful saying if a man desires the position of a bishop, and remember, bishop, overseer, pastor, shepherd, elder, we're all talking about the same thing here, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, <clears throat> having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, that means new convert, not a new convert, lest being puffed up with pride he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. We, we've got four men who meet these qualifications, and they meet them well, and we're so thankful for our four elders. Um, let, let's notice a, a, just a few more passages. Go to Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> and this is where Paul meets with the Ephesian elders. And I think it would be appropriate to, to read this, this entire section right here. Uh, Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 17. And just as what we just read in 1 Peter chapter 5 uses all three words to describe the same office, Paul uses all three words to describe the same office here as well in Acts chapter 20. So beginning in verse 17, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all... Now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, notice verse 17, it's elders. Now in verse 28, uh, shepherd, well, first of all, he says, uh, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So it's not, the shepherd would not only be a title, it's also a description, isn't it? Uh, verse 29, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch... And remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those 
who are sanctified. I, we'll, we'll go ahead and stop there. But it gives them this warning. And the warning should be for all of us. You know, for our elders today and for, for everyone in the church that you got to, you know, be careful. It could happen. Uh, what about 30 years later? Uh, when the Apostle John wrote to the church in, in Ephesus, what had happened? They had left their first love. And I thought that now, don't get me wrong, they were doing a lot of things right at the church in Ephesus. But it seems like they might not have been doing them with the right motive. Uh, they, and, and you've got to remember, they had not only had the Apostle Paul in their congregation, they, they even had the Apostle John in their congregation right before all of this happened. Now, think about it. If a church could have two apostles within a 30-year period in their congregation, now you'd think they'd be really close to the Lord and not able to fall away. I mean, if anybody could not fall away, it would be that church at Ephesus. Think about that. And yet, they had left their first love. Now, if it can happen at Ephesus, guess what? It can sure enough happen at commissary. So, let's be on guard. D? Well, I mean, they're not, it doesn't mean sinless, but it means that they are walking before the Lord. It's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth in Luke chapter 1. Uh, the, father, the, the parents of uh, John the Baptist, it doesn't say that they were sinless, but it does say they were blameless. They were walking before the Lord. They were keeping His commandments. It's kind of like walking in the light of God's Word. That th this is what they're doing and those from the outside cannot make an accusation against their lifestyles, basically what it means. Uh, Larry? And uh, for the present day, we all make mistakes. Mm -hmm. We don't do things wrong from time to time. So that makes us then to be simple people. However, if I do something wrong toward an individual, and I come back and I apologize to that individual for what I've done, then they cannot bring that up later on Right. Mm -hmm. Doing the right thing, even if what we did was wrong, we correct that as much as within our correct yeah. position. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. And did I just read it in First Timothy or is it in Titus? Or it may be in both places that they were to have a good reputation of those outside. It, I just read it in First Timothy 3. Okay. Uh, all four of our elders have a good reputation among those who are outside. I, I believe that with all my heart. I know they do. I'm so thankful for them. Um, let's notice a couple more passages. Let's go to First Thessalonians. Another point you made about apostles. Uh huh. Just church. Not only were not only that, but the elders were probably endowed with some. Yeah, yeah, a good point. Yeah, Thomas said not only did they have a couple of apostles at that congregation, but they had miraculous gifts in the church. And uh, they were still led astray. You know, so even amongst the apostles, though, I've been reading through the Gospels, and it just, it's just, it's not funny, but it kind of is. You know, they get to the, the feeding the 5,000. Or the apostles are saying, how are we going to feed all these people? Well, Jesus feeds them all. Then when they get to the 4,000, mm -hmm. they're asking again, how are we going to feed all yeah. <laughs> Do you not remember what I did last week? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, well, I've, it was, I've thought that. about that. Yeah. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, and we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. 
Be at peace among yourselves. You know, if, we're, if we are at peace among ourselves, you realize how much easier that makes the elder's job? Well, we got a big responsibility to play as, as members underneath the oversight of the elders. If we are at peace among one another, that makes all the difference in the world to the job that the elders are tasked with. It really does. It makes their job a whole lot easier. It makes their job a whole lot more enjoyable. And I'm thankful for such a congregation as Commissary that we do all love one another and we get along with one another. It's, it's good. It, I've, I've seen that not happen and that's not good. Uh, yeah, you hear those things happening in other congregations. It's a terrible thing. It, it, let's make sure we don't do that. Let's make sure we love one another. And I'm so thankful that we do. Uh, turn now to Hebrews chapter 13. Amen. Yes. Oh, yeah. He repented. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, a couple of different verses here. <clears throat> Verse 7. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Whose faith follow. You know, remember when Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, says, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. He says, as long as I'm imitating Christ, you follow me. That's what Paul is saying. Well, as long as our elder t elders are imitating Christ, as long as our elders are following Jesus, let's follow them. Whose faith follow? And then, <clears throat> same chapter, down in verse 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. What's one of the best ways that they can do so with joy is if we're at peace among ourselves, if we get along with each other, if we love one another. So uh, just a few passages here. It looks like he's about ready to ring the bell. Do we have any comments before we close? <clears throat> All right, we didn't get very far this morning, but that's okay. Uh, Lord willing, next week, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Thanks for your comments. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to have each and every one of you with us this morning. It's about time for us to begin our worship this morning. We're glad to see this good number with us today. Encourage, encourage you to uh, get a songbook and be willing, ready to participate in our song service. In a moment, several announcements to go over this morning. I hope you have picked up a bulletin. Some, most of them are, are there. First, we want to encourage you to check on your electronic devices and be sure they're quiet this morning. And also, there is a nursery for anyone that has a need for it to the left as you exit the auditorium there. See, the blinds are closed, but they can be opened. And you can see if you have to go and spend some time there. It's fine. We will meet again tonight at 5.30, and then on Wednesday night at 7. I invite you to come and be with us at those times, if you would. It's always good to see an audience, you know, see the pews full out there. I know it's encouraging to our preachers as they have to speak to us it's to see that there's a group of people here. Okay, uh, 
Remember those that are grieving, the Bradley Phillips family, and also the Larry Breckenridge family. There is a uh, note in there for Don Ork, and I mentioned him needing some help, assistance at home, but he also has been back in the hospital again to remove fluid. So notice that and remember that and the work of uh, anyone you know or if you might be able to spend some time there with him at home. Frances Dacus is back home. She's being treated for her blood pressure there. Glad to hear that. I want to continue to remember uh, Glenda Clements. She is in St. Bernard's. And uh, another, let's see, I think I thought I had a, maybe not St. Bernard's. But anyway, but we have a uh, young lady, Brenda Trawick. She is in the ICU in Paragu. Peggy Carr is at home. This is Tammy's mother, mother and Henry's mother-in-law is at home, sick with the flu. Wade Taylor on Wednesday is going to have cartilage surgery in St. Bernard's. Remember, didn't remember him. Let's go down this list. Also, uh, this morning after our communion service, we will have, we will be honoring our seniors this morning. And then tonight we will also have a potluck after our evening services. Invite you to come and participate with us tonight also. There are some glasses on the table in the foyer. If you haven't picked up your sunglasses for tomorrow, why? Uh, there are some out there if you need that. I haven't made any plans yet for that. Is there anything else? I think I've been checked off my list here that we didn't, uh, they didn't mention. Okay, Hart. The course from CRA will be here Wednesday night and the uh, church is supplying pizza, but uh, we were asked to uh, bring drinks and some desserts. Okay. We need to bring drinks and desserts Wednesday night. Uh, the chorus will be here, and after their uh, after services that night, then we will meet in the fellowship building there. Is that everything today? That was over here, kind of on the right. I just forgot it, part. <laughs> uh, but anyway, okay. So, Wes will be leading our singing this morning, and invite you to join in with that. Art will be bringing us a lesson, and our closing prayer will be by Mark Rowe, and now Mike will lead us in our opening prayer. Pray with me, please. Almighty Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning as a congregation to come before you and ask for favors. We ask that you be with the Larry Breckenridge family and, and the Phillips family of uh, Merle and Vera, comfort those in their family for the losses that they've sustained. Father, we ask that you be with Brandy Traylick, Glendy, Glenda Clements, Francis Dacus, Peggy Carr, Don Ork, and those that are sick among us or needing help. Be with Wade Taylor as he goes through his carotid artery surgery. We ask that you would be with our young people, and as we remember them today, many of them have been in Christian training longer than they've been in high school and college or whatever. And we're proud of our young people, and we want to keep up our training with the other young people as they come up in the church. It's very important to have a foundation. It's the most important part of the building. 
most important part of the mind, and they need that foundation. And as a congregation, we need to reach out to other children and, and those that are not getting the guidance they need and see what we can do. Father, we ask that you be with us in our worship today. Be with the Lord as he brings us our lesson. And be with Wes as he leads us in singing. Our singing has been very good here lately, and we appreciate that. Father, we ask that you would watch over this nation. Help us to be an influence. Help us to be a good example wherever we are. That kindness spreads just like evil. And we need to overcome the evil. And help us to recognize what needs to be done. Father, we appreciate all that you do for us. We're in a country that we're in a land of opportunity in a state that's motto is land of opportunity. We have so many opportunities and there's so many people that don't want to take advantage of the jobs available and different things. We, we ask that you, you that we could be, help us to be an influence on these people so we can all work together and share the joy, share the love that you want us to. Be with us now in our worship service, Father, as we continue to worship. And this is our prayer we offer up to you in the name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Master. Amen.
Exactly six months ago today, on October the 7th, 2023, Hamas terrorists from Gaza launched a deadly invasion of Israel and massacred approximately 1,200 people. They shot them, they mutilated them, they decapitated them, they sexually assaulted them, and they kidnapped about 240 individuals. It was a terrible day. There's now war in Israel, and war, war is a horrific occasion. This was not the first time that uh, Israel had been invaded. Through the years and through the centuries, they have been victims of foreign invasions on many occasions. Nebuchadnezzar invaded Israel on three different dates. 605 BC, came back about a decade later in 597, returned a decade after that in 586, completely destroying city of Jerusalem, its walls, and its temple. Babylonians utilized all kinds of cruel methods in their invasions of other countries. For example, when they came to Jerusalem in 586, the king, Zedekiah, fled. And they pursued him, and when they caught him, they brought him back to Jerusalem 
and they executed his sons in front of him. And then they gouged out his eyes. Last thing that he saw was the death of his sons. Then they carried him away into Babylonian captivity. When Nebuchadnezzar would invade another land, he looked for young, good-looking, intelligent individuals that he could train to help him run the government. They didn't have to have Babylonian blood in them. They just needed to be intelligent so that they could help him do what he needed to do. We know the names of four of these individuals that he took from Jerusalem. There was Daniel. They gave him a Babylonian name, Belshazzar. There was Hananiah. They gave him the name of Shadrach. Mishael, they named him Mejak. And Azariah, they gave him the Babylonian name of Abednego. You're familiar with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're not sure exactly how Nebuchadnezzar captured his victims. We really don't find that information in secular history and not in the Bible either. Perhaps the soldiers invaded the synagogue schools. The Israel people had their schools in their synagogues, their houses of worship. And perhaps they invaded these schools and forcefully dragged the captives away from their teachers. Try to imagine the scene. They would have been yelling and screaming, crying, kicking, begging, and even praying. Try to imagine how it was when they got to Babylon, hundreds of miles away from home. There was a new language to learn. New customs. It was all new to these young people. They probably never saw their families or friends again. And Daniel was still in Babylon 66 years later when he was an old man, according to Daniel 1, verse 21. Today, we honor our five high school seniors. And they will soon enter a new world. Some things will remain the same. Many things will be different. Hopefully, it will never be as traumatic and different as Daniel and his friends faced. But there will be challenges. And how they meet these challenges can make all the difference in a world. That's true with all of us. How we meet our challenges will make a difference. We hope and we pray these five wonderful young people will enjoy a tremendous amount of success in their future lives. But there's one thing that uh, they need to remember and there's one thing that all of us need to remember. Our success in life greatly depends on the decisions that we make. Our success in life greatly depends on the decisions that we make. Good decisions or bad decisions are ahead of us. We're going to have three points in our lesson this morning. First of all, I want us to notice the decisions that these four friends made, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. First of all, they were fed a, a new diet. And there were certain foods that the Babylonians ate that the Jews were not allowed to eat. There was a whole list of unclean foods that uh, 
the Jewish people were not allowed to eat. And so Daniel and, and his friends decided, we're not going to eat this food. And we're not going to drink this wine. And they were told, you, you have to. And they said, we can eat vegetables and be fine. You, you look at us after 10 days of eating vegetables and see if we are as healthy as the others. And so they allowed them to do that. And they appeared to be more healthy and better off than those who were eating the Babylonian food. But they were told, here, you eat this. And their attitude was, we're not allowed to eat that. You drink this wine, we're not allowed to drink that. We weren't brought up that way. That's not what we were taught. We're not going to do it. Made the decision to do what they had been taught by their parents and by their teachers. And then in chapter 3, we read where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego made a decision that was a good decision. Nebuchadnezzar built a a tower. The thing was 90 feet tall and it was 18 feet wide and it was built in his honor. And the individuals were told that every time you hear a command, you bow down and worship this tower built to Nebuchadnezzar's honor. They wouldn't do it. And they were instructed, anybody that does not bow down is going to be thrown in a fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were brought before the authorities and they were told, if you don't bow down, you're going to be thrown in a fiery furnace. That would scare a lot of people and I'm sure that they experienced some fear. But they said, we're not going to do it. Why? They'd been brought up differently. They've been taught differently. They weren't going to go against what they'd been taught. They weren't going to go against what they knew was wrong. They made a decision. And they said, our God is able to deliver us. They believed that with all their heart. But then they made a statement. <laughs> it's there in third chapter, verse 16 of Daniel. You want to know something they said? Even if he chooses not to deliver us, we're still not going to bow down. Because that's wrong. We're not going to do that. And you know the rest of the story that they were cast into the fiery furnace, but the Lord did deliver them. And then in chapter 6, we see Daniel, the fourth member of that group. Now, He's, he's not young any longer. This is years and years later when he's an old man. And uh, his acquaintances were jealous of him. And they approached the king and they said, let's, let's have a, a law that for 30 days no one is to make any requests at all except through you. And if anyone goes against that, he should be cast into a den of lions. Well, Daniel had a habit, good habit. He'd made the decision, I suppose, when he was still a boy in Jerusalem, that he was going to pray three times a day. Everybody knew he did this. He would pray facing Jerusalem. And now the threat of being thrown into a den of lions was before him. But after all these years, he was not going to go against what he'd been taught, what he had learned at the feet of his parents and his teachers. I'm not going to do it. He went ahead and prayed anyway. And you know the rest of the story. It's a well-known story there in Daniel 6. He was cast into lion's den but God rescued him God delivered him he made the right decision I could well imagine that whenever Daniel was cast into the uh, den he might have thought this is it 
I'm going to die. But I'm still going to make this decision. And he was faithful to God. And so those are decisions made by the four friends. Right decisions. And then the second point, I want us to notice some decisions of other young people in the Bible. I think of Joseph in uh, Genesis 39. Joseph uh, was a, one with a coat of many colors. His brothers were jealous of him. They sold him into uh, slavery. And when he was in Egypt, he had the job of being the overseer in Potiphar's house. He had been sold to Potiphar. Potiphar's wife tried to get him to commit immorality with her. And she pursued him day after day, and he said, no, no. And one day, when just the two of them were in the house, she approached him one more time. He said, no, I will not sin against my master and against my God. She grabbed him by his coat, but he fled to see him. She accused him of trying to take advantage of her, and he was thrown back in prison where he spent a number of years before he was finally released through a series of miracles on God's part. But he made the decision. He had learned what was right and what was wrong when he was home back in the land of Palestine. He said, I'm going to remember that. I'm not going to go against that. Paid a big price for that, having been thrown in prison. And I think of another young man. His name is Rehoboam. Rehoboam was Solomon's son. When Solomon died, Rehoboam became king. And he made three decisions. He said, I'm going to go talk to the old men, see what advice they give me in running the kingdom. It's a good decision. And he went and talked to the old man, and the old man said, you know, you get along with the people. You try to do what's right for them. You think of the people. And then he made a second decision. I think I'm going to talk to some of the, my friends, young ones that had grown up with him, see what they have to say. Young people, a lot of times listening to your friends is not a good decision. He went and gathered them together. He said, how should I rule the people? They said, you be tough on them. You show them who's boss, paraphrasing here. If they thought your dad was tough, you're going to be even tougher. You let them know who's boss. The decision he made, third decision, was I'm going to take the advice of the young men. And he spurned the advice of the older ones. That's nearly always a bad decision, to take advice of young ones over the advice of those that have been around a while. And as a result, and again, it's a long story, and you can read it for yourself, the kingdom split. Some of the people said, we're not going to follow you. Ten tribes said, we're not going to follow Rehoboam. And the kingdom never did get back together. You had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and it remained that way forever. And then we have a decision made by a young man in the New Testament. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell the story of this young man. We call him the rich young ruler. Uh, the Bible never uses the words rich young ruler. You have to go to all three Gospels and put them together and you'll know that he was a rich young ruler. And he came running to Jesus. Read this for one in one place, Matthew 19. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you keep the commandments and you'll live. He said, I've kept all the commandments ever since I was young. What do I lack? Even though he kept all these commandments, he knew something was missing. 
This morning throughout the world, and maybe even in this auditorium, there are people who know something's missing. What was missing in this young man's life? It was Jesus. He said, Jesus said to this young man, you go sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you come and follow me. And the Bible says he turned away sorrowfully. Why? Because he had great riches. Jesus loved this young man, Mark said. But he turned away. He made the decision to give his allegiance to what he had his possessions, instead of giving his allegiance to Jesus Christ, made the wrong decision. Third point I want to make this morning, I want to talk about some good decisions that you young people can make. And by the way, the rest of us can too. Let me suggest to you that you read the book of Proverbs in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon, who made a lot of mistakes, gave some really good advice in those two books to young people. And, and when you're reading through Proverbs, he, he will single out the fact that I'm speaking to young people. But again, all of us, those of us that are older, need to read Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, learn the many good lessons from it. And then I would suggest, uh, you know the name of this highway out here, it's Highway 412. Most of you know that, don't you? Uh, put 1 Timothy in front of that. 1 Timothy 412 is a good passage of scripture. It's a good passage for all of us to learn, but young people especially. 1 Timothy 4 verse 12. In 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul is speaking to Timothy, who's a young man. And he says, don't let anyone look down upon your youth, or don't let anyone use your youth against you. Sometimes those of us that are older, we'll look at someone who's younger and say, well, he's just a young person. We won't give you the credit you deserve. Or maybe you even make a mistake and we say, well, he's young, didn't know any better. And Paul says, don't let someone use your youth against you. But be a good example. He said, be a good example in speech. Young people, do you watch what you say? Jesus said, every idle word, every careless word, you'll give an account of in a day of judgment. Matthew 12. Verse 36. And then he says, you need to be a good example when it comes to conduct. How do you conduct yourself from day to day? Is your conduct, when you're with your mom and dad, when you're sitting in a church pew, the same as when you're out here with your friends? Jesus said, for hereunto, or rather Peter said, for hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered, leaving us an example that we should walk in his steps. 1 Peter 2.21. There was a book written back in the 1890s called In His Steps by Charles Sheldon. I've made reference to that book uh, when preaching on 1 Peter 2.21 in the past. That book is still in print. And if you can remember to look for a book called In His Steps, read it. Good stuff there. Look on the internet. See where you can get that book. I'm sure it wouldn't cost much. I have a copy of it if you want to borrow it. In His Steps. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. 
Be an example in your conduct, the way you act, what you do, where you go, who you hang out with, all that. He said, you be a, a good example when it comes to love. Uh, Mark 12, verse 30, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And I know certain <laughs> preachers and certain biblical scholars have tried to analyze what each one of those little phrases mean. And I think what Jesus is saying, you love God with everything you've got. Everything you've got. It's a big order. And you put him first. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Matthew 6, 33. Let me say something. Some of you will be going to college, some of you trade school, some of you, uh, you may be going military, I don't know, or maybe you just go straight into the job market and you hope to make a good living. Your parents want you to make a good living. There's more to life than money and we need to remember that. And remember the Lord's first. And when you read Matthew 6, he said, don't be overly concerned about food, shelter, and clothing, and all these things. You seek God's kingdom first. These things will be added to you. God will take care of you. David said in Psalm 37, I've been young and I'm an old man. And I've not seen God's children forsaken or his seed, his offspring, begging bread. Verse 25 of Psalm 37. He said, I've been around a long time. I've never seen God's people forsaken. God takes care of us. But we need to love him with everything we have. Number one, be an example in that. Jesus said, he who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, 37. You love your parents, and you should. You should love them with everything you got. But love God the most. Be an example when it comes to love. He said, you, you be an example in faith. Jesus said, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. John 8, 24. In Revelation 2 and verse 10, the Bible says, be faithful to the point of death and you'll receive the crown of life. Let me say something to those of you that are young. The crown of life may not, <laughs> may not come to your mind very often. For those of us that are older, we think about it quite a bit. You say, well, it's a long time in the future, and I hope it is, but it might not be. Be faithful even to the point of death. You'll get a crown of life. And then he told Timothy, he said, you be an example when it comes to purity. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And so the advice to those of you that are young, advice to those of us that are not so young, we need to be examples. We need to be examples in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. One thing I want to leave you with, one decision can make you or break you. Make the right decision, that's good. Make the wrong decision, and it can break you. Need to remember what Joshua said to the children of Israel before they entered into the promised land. He said, choose you yourselves today whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served which were beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I would hope that's the decision that all of us 
make. And then Elijah said to children of Israel when they didn't know which way to go. It's a great story there in 1 Kings 18. Read it again. He said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. We are a group of believers. We believe the Lord is God. Believing that, let's follow him. Let's do his will. Do you need to make a decision today? A decision for the Lord? Now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Second Corinthians 6 verse 2. The opportunity may not be there later due to a number of factors. But you can make the decision this morning. Do you need to make the decision to become a child of God by being baptized in the Christ? Maybe you've done that, but you've gone the other direction. You can come back to him by repenting and praying. And maybe this morning you just would like your brothers and sisters to pray with you at this time. You're a faithful Christian, but you struggle from time to time as we all do. And if you have the need for us to pray with you and for you, that's why we're here. If you're subject to the invitation, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing. Hear the sweet voice of Jesus say, Come unto me, I am the way. Hearken the love.
As we gather here on this fine Lord's Day, let us remember that while there is still war in the world, a war that was already fought and won for us is our salvation. The Lord gave his life so that we may live and have a chance at redemption. Let us remember that no power, principles, or authority could ever separate us from that love. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Lord, we come to you this day and we ask that you be with us and help us remember your sacrifice, how your body was pierced and hung on the cross so that we could have redemption. And it was a price that you paid and freely given as a gift for us as long as we accept it, Father. Thank you for all that you've done and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we continue our thanks, Father, for Jesus, that great sacrifice that he suffered on the cross, Father. This time, Father, we thank you for his blood that was shed for us that continually washes our sins from us as long as we stay in him. Thank you, Father, for the great blessing Thank you for his love. Thank you for your love. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Let's pray. Father, we've just been thinking about the greatest gift that you've ever given us and how important that is to us. And Father, now we want to think about the other gifts that you've given us. They're important also. We're glad we have them. And Father, we ask that you help us to use them the way you want us to. Bless us always, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please ask the other elders to join me up here, please. I'll keep my part brief. <clears throat> One time there was a young man, a little boy riding around in a truck with his dad. And he said, Dad, how big is God? And the dad was kind of concerned. He said, man, I, I don't know that I exactly know how to explain that. As he, as he rode around, he began to think of the best way to explain this to the little boy. And he looked up in the sky and he saw a, a jet. And he said, son, he said, you see that jet in the sky? He said, yeah. He said, how big is that jet? He said, well, man, that, that jet's tiny. He said, yes, it is, son. And he said, so he made a loop around town. He drove by the airport. And he said, he, as he drove by the airport, he, he could see the jets out there on the runway. And he said, how big is that jet? He said, Dad, that thing's huge. He said, yes, it is, son. He said, God's the same size. He said, the closer you are to God, the bigger it is. I'd like to read James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. As I call your name, if you'll please come forward. Lucy Horton. Ariston King. Cash McAvoy. Abby Nicely. Mallory Oden. <coughs> Some of these kids I know, I've known from a long time, sometimes some of them I don't know very well.
But I can tell you one thing. Uh, they're here this morning. I know they're loved. And one thing I'd like for you all to know, uh, as you look out here, I'm guessing we're probably about 160, 170. There's 160, 170 people here that love y'all. And regardless of where, as you grow up and you move on, uh, we hope that you find a church family and a church home. Uh, know that you're loved here. We hope you, uh, if you choose to be here, wherever you choose to be, remember that uh, a church family is, is one of the biggest and best families you'll ever have. Uh, if you'll please pray with me. Father, we come before you at this time so grateful for the many blessings you give us. Father, we're thankful for your son and his willingness to die on the cross, and we're so thankful that he was willing to do so that we may have an opportunity to spend eternity with you in heaven. Father, at this time, we ask a very special prayer for Lucy, for Ariston, for Cash, for Abby, and for Mallory. Father, we ask that you give them the courage and the desire to serve you. We ask that you be with them and give them the ability to discern what is right and what is wrong. Father, we ask that you look upon us as a congregation, as a body of believers, as a body of Christians, as fathers, as mothers, as grandparents, as teachers, as friends and family, that we can set the example, that we can show them the ways that you would have us to live, and that we can support them in any way that you would have us to support them. Father, help us to, to share our wisdom. Our, that, Father, help us to be very transparent with them. Help us to teach them from our mistakes. Father, no one's perfect. No one except for your son. And Father, our mistakes have been, have, have given us wisdom and that we can, we can teach them from those. And Father, I want, to, I want them to understand that it's okay to make mistakes, that your forgiveness and your grace is what makes us and allows us that opportunity to come to you any time that we have the opportunity. And Father, that your grace is what allows us to be, be cleansed from those sins and that your blood is what what cleanses those sins and that each time that we do fall short that all we have to do is come to you begging repentance and father we if we turn away from that way and we turn away from the worldly wisdom and we look to you for spiritual wisdom like Paul speaks of then you will have us in your kingdom father please be with us as we leave here today please be with these young people forgive us when we fail you in Jesus name amen Tenants this morning was 173. Sure, sure glad everyone came out again this morning. Hope to see everyone back tonight at 5 30. Let's stand. We'll sing the first verse of number 502. That's the best song to let our closing for 502. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the sky. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. together our father in heaven lord we we thank you so much for this church family we thank you for the leaders of this church and the preachers lord we we ask that you continue to bless this church 
Lord, we, we also ask for your blessings on these young people that were recognized today. Ask that you will guide them, give them the wisdom they need, and the courage to, to do what's right. Lord, now we ask that uh, you forgive us of any sins that we've committed, and we pray that you will be with us, keep us all safe, till we meet again. This in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.